Welcome back to another episode of URI Studio, where I answer questions and address issues that come up all the time at URI panels and at lectures. Today, I'm being a little silly as we're not addressing a question per se, but a Twitter meme that happened earlier this year. I was doing a poll of my Okazu patrons about some topics for this next video, and their answers made this video pop into my head. You may remember the how it began and how it's going meme. Well, between that and the patron poll, thank you Okazu patrons, Today we're going to be talking about Yuri tropes, in other words, Yuri, how it began, and how it's going. If you've watched some of our previous videos, you've heard me talk about Yamagishi Ryoko's manga, Shiroya Heia no Futari. In the last video, I was focusing on it as a use of an exotic, i.e. non-Japanese location, for the setting of early BL and Yuri stories. Today I'm again starting with it because, as what I think of as the first Yuri manga, our journey begins here. Here, in a private school for wealthy girls, our cheerful, cute protagonist Racine comes to a school and is put in a distant room with an emotionally intense, dark-haired girl. Simone and Racine become friendly, but their emotions are more than friends, and during the school play, they kiss. Okay, you know this story, obviously. If you've read just about any Yuri in the past 50 years, you've come across this couple. This is pretty much the bog-standard Yuri trope for the 20th century. So let's break this couple down a bit. Racine is physically cute, emotionally she's an innocent and uncarved block, impressionable, cheerful, energetic. Simone is worldlier, cynical maybe, but definitely intense. Simone goes out drinking and dancing, this is France, remember, and she has a compelling aura. Simone is hypnotizing, Racine cannot resist. This couple is so emblematic of Yuri that even those couples that don't conform visually, there's always a sense of this couple in the background. So, when Yumi finally accepts Sachiko's rosary in Maria Samagamitaru, Sachiko being a little high strung and a little much to deal with is a given. But what happened in the 2000s to this couple wasn't just an endless reiteration of the stereotype, because in the 2000s and 2010s, that emotionally intense character was often written as emotionally damaged, even rapey. Her emotional intensity stems from some, well, let's be honest here, some poorly written cipher for what ought to have been abuse in a better written story, some trauma. While the cheerful, innocent character becomes a blithering idiot incapable of almost anything. So yeah, that trope hasn't fared all that well, but there is hope. We'll get there in a second. The Girl Prince is historically a conflation of Takarazuka musical review tropes and Disney movies, coupled with a deep sense of duty and achievement, and cool uniforms. In reality, for a Yuri fan, The Girl Prince is a reflection of our deepest desire to be a noble hero, to be a prince, and to sweep the princess off her feet and ride off with her into the sunset. We're going to talk about the Girl Prince really briefly because I want to do a deeper dive on this one day. After the tropic Yuri couple, the Girl Prince is one of the most recognizable Yuri tropes. The Girl Prince is both an epitome of what we find cool, like Haruka and Sailor Moon, and an amalgam of the kind of cold charm we aspire to as Shinokita Reiko from uh, Yajikita Gaku and Dochuki. When my generation were children, we were still being told that the prince saves the princess, but I know I was not the only girl sitting there thinking, I don't want to be rescued, I want to do the rescuing. The Girl Prince is the embodiment of this desire, and now, in the 21st century, I think we can look forward to her being the embodiment of more than just that desire. I think it's fair to say that the longevity of the Yuri Sekai no Charisma, the hashtag name given to Haruka Michiru pictures on Pixiv, are an indication that the Girl Prince and her equally cool, lovely, and competent princess consort are an embodiment of all the best things we hope to have and to be. When I say to you that the 1990s and 2000s were filled with best friends who may or may not have loved in vain, which iconic character do you think of? Was it a hopeless best friend or was there a chance at the end of it all? 
Were you among those of us in early Yuri days rooting for Nana and Hitomi or their spiritual descendants Mari and Ahiko because we could see what they could not, that although they were best friends, they were really meant to be more? Did you take the bright and airy best friend route and find yourself cheering Fumi and Akira as they got together, even though they thought they'd both moved on? Maybe you're on board with Hime and Yano, hoping they can both be honest with one another and also want the same thing at the same time? Or were you among those who preferred the darker road in which a best friend's love or desire might be real, but it can never have hope? Maybe you loved Kanazuki no Miko's Chikane, whose desire for the priestess of the sun drove her mad, causing her to murder her in one life, assault her in another, and in this most recent iteration of the worst relationship ever, she's already being tormented because, of course, the story itself hasn't changed at all with the times. Or was your favorite Yaya who combined both of the above, letting her desire for Hikari drive her mad, leading her to assault her, and then subsume that desire to helping Hikari and Amana be happy? Or how about Homura, whose gratitude and love became twisted into anger as she failed repeatedly to save Maruka? So many of us who'd grown up actually in love with our best friends, whether we had happy endings for ourselves or not, understood the emotions of the best friend who convinced herself that all she ever wanted was her friend's happiness. We all knew that feeling and we all expected to live with it for a long time, but the 2010s and 2020s gave us a different option. In 2002, in the anime for Azuma Gadayo, Kaori, known as Kaorin, has a fantasy of what is meant to be a comedic beat. That is to say, she imagines she's marrying Sakaki-san. To indicate that she and we understood what she meant, that this was a gay fantasy, we hear church bells and see rainbow jets. They failed, however, to give us lilies instead of going with the rose, which was associated with gay men. I guess JC staff and Madman had no gay culture consultants on staff. Oh well. Just a few years later, a Yuri wedding trope was starting to appear in manga pages, Fashion shows in which couples dressed like bride and groom or eventually bride and bride slowly morphed over time to random fashion shoots for couples to play act weddings. In 2007, the faux wedding might look like vows to be a toile in strawberry panic or something more elaborate but equally as fantastic like the cover of Fujieda Miyabi's Iono Sama Fanatics. Remember, Iono Sama is the queen of her country, she can do whatever she wants. By the 2010s, there were real countries that allowed same-sex weddings, and the adult women who drew Yuri Manga wanted in. In 2011, Marishima Akiko drew a two-volume series about women who worked in a wedding planning company. When Saki merely dresses the part of a bride with her former girlfriend, that's enough to cause her current girlfriend concern. It's dress up I Get over it. And in 2013, the fashion shoot was so common it no longer had the impact we wanted. One of Fujieda Miyabi's assistants created his own series, a series that was a complete game changer for Yuri. Sure, there was no marriage for same-sex couples in many places, including parts of the US, but there was definitely room for same-sex marriage ceremonies. In 2011, Minamoto Hisanari created Fufu, a series about two adult women who are de facto wife and wife. The story begins with them starting their new life together as a couple, living together, buying furniture, enjoying day-to-day -day pleasures, what I call playing house. And it ends with a marriage ceremony witnessed by their friends and family. It has no legal status, but if you recall the refrain of the standard wedding ceremony, you'll also understand what it means to people to have friends and family gathered here to witness the joining of. Japan did not, and still does not, have marriage equality, but in 2019, the idea of the Yuri marriage was explored in a number of anthologies, including one explicitly called Brides, and at least one two-volume series that explored Yuri weddings, Yuri Kekon, Yuri Khan. But this desire for Yuri weddings opened up a whole new can of worms. Once we had our ceremonies, it was natural for the queer audience to start asking for more. Is it enough just to have characters who marry? Many Yuri fans, including myself, don't think so. We want openly queer characters who aren't denying their gayness. It's 2021 now, and if I ask you to name a Yuri media with openly gay characters, how many can you name? I can think of a couple, a bunch of random missed stories, Moonlight Flowers, Gunjo, Free Soul, Transit Girls, My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, and a couple of handfuls of other series. But the fact that I have to think about it is actually the point. While parts of the world have marriage equality, Japan is sloughing its way towards second-class status for same-sex partnerships that will inevitably one day become marriages at some point. 
possibly sooner now that their Supreme Court has ruled that marriage equality needs to exist, which brings me to how it's going, or as I like to think of it as modeling a queer future. Sure, we want gay weddings, but we also want gay characters having those gay weddings. We're going to wrap this up with a series that I think has set the bar pretty high for the 2020s, Watashi no Oshi wa Akujaku Reijo, or I'm in love with the villainess. This series, written by Inori Sensei, has starts off as kind of a goofy gay comedy and quickly becomes an openly queer story as protagonist Rei has to address her own failings to accept who she was in her former life. Now reborn into the world of her favorite otome game, Rei admits she's a lesbian, gives up just wanting her love interest to be happy, then actively pursues the villainess and, while she's at it, creates an alternative family and has a Yuri wedding with the love of her life at which family and friends are there to witness their vows, which were, I'm going to say, very moving. So we've seen how Yuri began. And now I think we can look at the second part of this meme and address, how's it going? It's going pretty well so far, thanks. But I think there's still plenty of room for it to grow. Let's take a look again in a few years at this and see if Yuri is still pacing real life or a force for pushing it forward. I know that's asking a lot from Yuri Media, but you know, I think it could do it. I've got my fingers crossed for an openly gay Yuri protagonist, and I hope to see one marry her girlfriend in a legal ceremony sometime soon. So that's my thoughts on Yuri, how it started, and how it's going. Before I wrap up, I just want to say we're doing a big reboot of the YuriCon store where these manga are all available. We have the largest listing of Yuri Media in English and Japanese gathered together, and you can shop on multiple outlets so you can support the online retailer you prefer to use. You can search in Japanese for English by creator name, title, publisher, genre, subgenre. I hope you'll drop by. Links to all the series I mentioned here are in the show notes. Thanks for joining me again today. Thanks to all my Okazu patrons for making this video possible. I hope you'll join us on the Okazu Patreon and subscribe to this channel here on YouTube. This is Erica Friedman, and I'll see you next time on Yuri Studio. Mm -hmm.